Uh, today, uh, it's been a busy week, uh, needless to say. We, we were up uh, way, way into the early morning hours, uh, many nights getting loaded and packed, and I could tell you all the stories and how uh, the movers didn't get there until dark. They were supposed to be there in the morning and they came after sunset. So we were moving till two and three in the morning, a couple nights, uh, loading trucks and things, but we got through it. Uh, and I thought, what do I speak about? So this morning I wrote a sermon uh, for today. It's been uh, just no time and very busy, but I felt uh, like let's pick a topic that uh, I know a lot about and something that's very important. We need to remind ourselves of its importance uh, on a regular basis anyway. And I wanna talk about uh, keeping the Sabbath and, and uh, doing that in a way that God would be pleased with. And so I wanna talk about uh, this topic. The Sabbath was made for man, as we know in Mark chapter two, verse 27, Christ said so. Now, he said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the Bible gives us abundant guidelines on how to keep the Sabbath properly and, and how to make the Sabbath a delight. And God intended it to be something that would be a blessing for mankind. All of God's laws, by the way, are that, that way. They're, they're blessings. And that's why it's really crazy to think that we would want to nail the laws to the cross, uh, like many people in the world feel, because the keeping of God's laws brings peace, it brings happiness, it brings abundance uh, in the life of the one who keeps it. Uh, we've been blessed to understand and have the knowledge of the truth and to know what these laws are. And we see that man perverts God's laws uh, always. And God really put things in a way that's very simple to understand. Uh, the hard part about keeping God's laws is actually doing it, uh, practicing it, putting it into motion in our lives because we're tempted to do the wrong things by Satan and society and even our own personal, you know, carnal human nature pulls us in a wrong direction. And so the keeping of God's laws is, is a challenging part, understanding them not so much if we're honest with the scriptures and look at what God said and what guidelines he gave us. I want to begin in Genesis chapter two today and uh, look at uh, what happened at the end of creation week. In Genesis chapter two, Verses two and three, it reads, On the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Uh, these verses say a lot. First of all, we understand the Sabbath is to be kept on the seventh day of the week. Uh, we used to have a booklet uh, in Worldwide Church of God entitled Has Time Been Lost? And we explained that the weekly cycle and, and the time in that weekly cycle has not been lost. We are actually keeping the Sabbath on the correct day of the week, the seventh day of the week. Uh, we don't need to go back any further really than the New Testament times when Jesus Christ walked the earth because we know he kept it on the correct day. So we don't have to go all the way back to Genesis. We only have to go back to when did Christ keep the Sabbath? We know he did it right. Uh, so just you know, a couple thousand years is all you have to go back. But we see here that God rested. Now God, you know, the Bible tells us that God doesn't get weary, God doesn't get tired. He doesn't need a break. Uh, he's not like we are, he's not mortal, he's not flesh and blood, he's not human. Uh, but he, he did this to set an example for us. And we see that Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, the one who created it, is the one in the New Testament scriptures who defined how to keep it. And who better to do it than the one who created the Sabbath, right? The one to interpret how to keep it properly. And he condemned the Pharisees for some of their practices and teachings and uh, how they had made the Sabbath a burden. And he taught us how to keep the Sabbath as he intended it originally. When it says here that God blessed the uh, seventh day, it means that. And he sanctified. The word sanctified means to set apart or to make holy uh, to set apart for holy use. And the Sabbath should be set apart and used in a holy manner. What does that mean? We'll talk more about that as we go. And uh, it also is a memorial of creation. We see that too when we look through the pages of the Bible. And that, uh, knowing that helps us understand how to keep the Sabbath as God originally intended. So it's a special day. It is a memorial of creation. It is holy, it is sanctified time. And 
God rested again. Uh, Isaiah 40, 28 is a good verse to throw in your notes because it tells us in Isaiah 40, 28 that God doesn't get tired. He doesn't get weary. He doesn't need a break. He's God. And someday we'll be born into God's family and we'll be God. And we won't get tired anymore. We won't need a break. And I can tell you this week, it would have been great to be like God and not got tired because we, we didn't get much sleep this week with the move and all the things we had to do. And, and many of you who work hard uh, during the week really appreciate the Sabbath where you can rest and get that sleep that you might not get uh, the rest of the week in just the same way. Now, it's also important to understand that God instituted the Sabbath from the very beginning of time, right? We see the days of creation. We see that each of those days, by the way, as you look through the book of uh, the first chapters in the book of Genesis, begin in, at the evening. And the evening and the morning were the first day, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And so God looks at time differently than the society in which we live today looks at time. Today, people count time according to the Roman counting from midnight. Uh, till midnight, right? The, the day begins at midnight, it ends at midnight, not according to what God says in the Bible. God says, no, the day begins at sunset and it ends at sunset. And so we have, as a church, uh, as it says in Leviticus chapter 23, kept the Sabbath as God intended from even to even, right? From sunset to sunset. And uh, let's go, let's actually go there and plan to, but Leviticus chapter 23, and we'll come back to Genesis here in a minute. We go to Leviticus chapter 23. This, uh, by the way, is a really important chapter uh, when it comes to Sabbath and the holy days. And if you're a young Bible student, uh, if I had you in one of my imperial schools Bible classes or uh, other uh, classes that I've taught Bible classes, I would say, look, this is a chapter you should know to go to always regarding the Sabbath and the holy days because they're all listed conveniently in one chapter right here in Leviticus 23 and you could easily chain reference your Bible make some notes in the margin by each of the holy days and then you could take people on a journey right through the holy days and you could answer questions that new people might have or friends at work or school might have and God begins the chapter here in chapter 23 he says uh, it says and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feast. So when it, and then you'll see, he starts in verse three with the Sabbath. The Sabbath is something we keep on a weekly basis. The other holy days, we keep these, these other Sabbaths, right, on an annual basis. But the weekly Sabbath is something we do every, every week. And God says, number one, they are holy convocations. And if you know what the word convoke means, it means to assemble. So this is a commanded assembly. It's a holy convocation. God commands us to be here on the Sabbath. And there are people who would like to do away with that or find excuses not to do that. And if you look at the history of God's people, you see that God's people have always been persecuted regarding the Sabbath. When we look at what's coming in prophecy and we read about the mark of the beast and we read about what's foretold to occur here in the few years right ahead of us and how that's going to be reinstituted, that has always been regarding Sabbath versus Sunday keeping. And the Sabbath has been a test commandment for God's people. It's been a challenge through history and people have been burned at the stake and people have been crucified and people have been tortured and imprisoned for keeping the Sabbath. And we see at certain periods in human history and in time that they had to move out into the mountains and valleys out of populated areas to, to keep God's laws and keep the holy days and keep the Sabbaths. They didn't quit doing it because times got tough. They didn't say, we can't do it. They didn't say the government won't allow us, so we're gonna stop keeping it. We ought to obey God rather than man so clear in Acts chapter four and Acts chapter five. And if man says you can't keep the Sabbath, we say, we're gonna ignore that. We're gonna keep the Sabbath. We're gonna find a way to do it. We might have to meet in our own buildings. We might have to meet at homes, but we will never stop obeying God and com uh, com his commanded uh, assembly and keeping it as he commanded us to do. It's a holy convocation. It's a commanded assembly. And then he said, these are my feasts. These are God's days, the Sabbath 
and the annual Sabbaths are God's feast. And he set this up for us. He says in verse three, six days shall work be done, but the seventh is a day, is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall don't do no work on it. It is a Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. It's also important to know that God calls this these days his feast. The Sabbath is really a feast day. And growing up in the church, uh, we always had our best meals on Friday night and on Sabbath. Uh, Mom always put extra effort into it. I remember even as a kid on Friday night, we would have you know the candles and we had a table setting, the nice china came out. Um, a lot of that work obviously was done before sundown and the table was set but we enjoyed a fine meal and we always had dessert, which I still love, but uh, you know, you tell I love dessert because uh, I'm, not, I'm not as trim as I should be, but uh, the Sabbath was always special. And even when we were kids, I remember we got to have wine. It was a teaspoon and a tiny glass, but we had wine and that was really awesome. And uh, the Sabbath was always special. It was a feast day. Now, uh, in saying that, you might say, well, wait, is it possible to fast on the Sabbath? Yes, there are occasions that we may need to fast on the Sabbath. Uh, I understand that. We know that Christ fasted, what, 40 days. That would have included several Sabbaths. We see Moses did that twice. Um, so we see examples. We know David fasted for seven days, uh, trying to beseech God to save his son that was born to Bathsheba. And so certainly there is a time and a place to fast on a Sabbath. Um, and we see that in scriptures, but generally speaking, it should be a day that's a feast day. It's a wonderful day that we look forward to. Uh, and that's how God set it up. That's how he arranged it. Um, if we go back to Genesis now, let's go back there for a minute. Actually, let's, let's move on. Let's jump up to Exodus 20. Let's just go on up to Exodus 20. And here we're going to look at a list of the Ten Commandments. And we're going to come to the fourth commandment as uh, God set these commandments up in verse 8. Notice what God says. Deuteronomy 20, verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Yet. That's interesting because God uses the word remember. Uh, you can't remember to do something if you never heard of it before. You don't know what it is. So this was put in place, put in motion right back in the very beginning. God created man and right on the seventh day he rested. And he sanctified, made the Sabbath holy and put it into motion. And he knew that man, mankind would need this day for a number of reasons that we'll see as we go through the scriptures. But in, in, when Moses is being used by God and God is speaking to ancient Israel, he didn't institute the Sabbath, he told them to remember it. It was something that had been kept by others before this time. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. Um, now it's important when you look at what God uh, did here, he wanted us to take a break from our normal work week on the Sabbath. And not only us, he says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, verse 10 here, in it you shall do no work, but he says also you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. <clears throat> God didn't say that you rest and everybody else works. He said, look, everybody takes a break. Today, if you have a business or you have a company, nobody works for you on the Sabbath or the annual holy days. That's, that's a break, right? They get a break. Uh, they're in your employment. Back then, you had manservants and maidservants. They got a break from their regular routine. And so it was always a blessing for people to be associated with God's people because they also got to enjoy the feast days, right? We see them going up to keep the feast with their... Uh, the household that they they uh, worked in, right? The manservants and maidservants and enjoyed these days along with God's people. And uh, God said that his people should be a blessing to the people around them. And we should be that yet today. They all got a break, even the animals got a break. Uh, I heard a sermon years ago from a minister at a feast site, he was talking about the Sabbath and he said, that uh, he had known of someone in a third world country that was still using oxen and a plow to put crops in the ground. It was still pretty primitive, but they were planting their crops that way yet. 
And this man came into the church and he realized when he read this verse that his oxen should rest as well. And so he didn't work on the Sabbath anymore and his ox, well, his oxen, uh, you know, a couple of them there, a team, they got to rest. And this guy, a, a few years later, ended up uh, dying and they never were able to get those oxen to work again on the Sabbath. Like they got in a groove <laughs> and they, they just, they couldn't get them to, to do anything. Like they were used to the rest day. I find that's, that's interesting that God works this way. It, it, it's uh, e even in, in uh, Exodus 12, when you're looking at the Passover, uh, God killed the firstborn of humans, but also of the beast. Um, so God, he, he's, he looks at this maybe you know differently than, than the world for sure, and we need to think more like God and look at this more like he does. In verse 11, it says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the God blessed the, seventh, the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Um, so again, this, this work that he is talking about here is referring especially to the labor of earning a living. Uh, mainly uh, in the days that we read about in the pages of the Bible, society was largely an agrarian type society. They were farmers. And, uh, and so the, the things that we read about are associated with that. But we can certainly see how those guidelines would apply to us yet today in a modern world in the church. And we also see, as it just said there, that the Sabbath is a memorial of creation. And one of the things that we did as kids growing up in the church, I was seven when we came in, into the Church of God, mom and dad were called, and uh, we came in in late 69, 1970 was first feast. And so we were just kids, I'm the oldest of five and two of, I have a sister and brother here today and families, and it's good to have them here. Uh, but we kind of, you know, grew up in this. I don't remember a whole lot before age seven. I remember a few things, uh, but we grew up in this way of life and uh, we were farming in those years in North Dakota. And when we came into the church, my dad found ways uh, to, you know, rest on the Sabbath. And it was interesting that, you know, when we came in, my God, uh, not my God, my dad uh, saw what God was telling uh, us in the pages of the Bible. And he said, look, our animals got to start resting on the Sabbath. And we had dairy cows, and everybody said, look, you've got to milk those cows on the Sabbath. They'll get mastitis if you don't. But my dad goes, no, they're resting too. And I remember when we came back uh, from services, we drive up to Canada for church up to a little place called Musaman, Saskatchewan. We drive all the way up there, 178 miles up to Saskatchewan, because we were just about seven miles south of the Canadian borders where we lived. And uh, we'd go to church, and we'd come home, and you could hear every cow right out there moaning and the milk's coming out of them and they just can't wait to be milked. But it's amazing that they adapted, just like those oxen, uh, they began to not produce as much milk. It's amazing what happened. And later, uh, one of the ministers told my dad, look, you, you could milk them if you had to on the Sabbath. And, and dad goes, it's already covered. God took care of that. We don't milk them on the Sabbath. I found that fascinating. Uh, he found ways to rest, like he would put all his haystacks in a row you put four lanes of fence down both sides and put an electric wire right up against the haystack on both ends so he didn't have to go feed the cattle even on the Sabbath. They would see the hay above and below the electric wire on both ends and then he could come out after sundown and put more hay out and more grain out. He got an electric watering trough. We lived up there, everything freezes in the winter. Uh, my granddad used to blow up uh, with dynamite holes in the ice so that cattle could, could drink. He'd do that for neighbors do it for us. Uh, my grandma used to hate when he warmed up dynamite in the oven because it worked better warm than it did cold. Uh, but he, he never blew the house up. Uh, but that's how it, we lived. It was a little rough. We didn't have running water and we didn't have electricity for a couple of years on that farm. It was old time uh, living. And finally when we got water and showers and you didn't have to go to the outhouse in the middle of winter, it was awesome. Uh, we really look forward to that, but th this is modern times. Most people in human history haven't had these conveniences, and they've lived a tougher life than most of us have had to live. And uh, what we find today is as soon as something happens, uh, everybody panics and everybody becomes a pansy, and they can't do anything. And I'm like, what's wrong, people? We need to toughen up a little bit. And uh, when we look at the Bible, uh, there were some tough men and women in the Bible, 
and they lived more rigorous lives than we do in many respects. But my dad's approach was we need to find ways to rest on the Sabbath. We've got to find a way to cut back on the workload. Those cattle still need to eat. When you look in the pages of the Bible, God allows you to water your animals or feed them on the Sabbath. Uh, God makes an allowance. They need to eat. They don't have to fast every seven days, right? If they're your animals, um, that's okay. But, but, but dad found a way to make it easier with less work. And uh, certainly sometimes you had to check on them, especially um, you know when they were having calves and things, you'd have to go down and take a look, see how all, all of them are doing. Uh, but the point was to try to rest. It was try to not do what I normally do the other six days of the week and really enjoy this time that God made holy. And so God, in the pages of the Bible, gives us simple guidelines uh, and shows us how to do this, how to do it right. And, and so I want to take a little time to look at, at those guidelines that he gives us. Let's go uh, now to Exodus 31. I want to point this out first, though. Exodus 31, we'll start in verse 14. And here we're talking about the Sabbath law. It says, you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore it is, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. You have to ask yourself if God takes this seriously or not. And that verse seems to indicate he, he really does take Sabbath and the keeping of the Sabbath seriously. You know, I, I've also explained that to people through the years when it comes to keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. Some people think, look, I can't get that much time off, I'll lose my job, or if I'm a farmer, I have to be out harvesting. And I finally, I'm getting a good stretch of weather, uh, and I need to do that. I'm not gonna be able to go to the feast, or I, I, maybe I can make half the feast. And then you go to Zechariah chapter 14, and you see what God says about keeping the Feast of Tabernacles in the millennium because people who don't do what God says, he said, you won't get rain. And I'll send a plague if I have to, to get your attention, but I want you to take the time off and go keep the feast. And so we've always told people, look, that's what the Bible says. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You need to take the time, take it off work, risk it if you have to, you might lose your job. Now there are things you can do to keep that job, like be a good employee all along, right? Show up on time, do good work when you get there, and your employer's not going to want to fire you. He's probably going to find a way, even if he tells you you can't take the time, he's probably going to find a way to, to, to make sure you have a job when you get back. Now, I've had bosses. I uh, remember in Tulsa, in this town, I had a job working for a guy in a cabinet shop, and he told me if I wasn't there on a Saturday to work, that don't show up Monday, you don't have a job. And I'd only been there a short time when he told me that. And I said, look, when I got hired, I told you I don't work on Saturdays. He said, well, we're all working. None of us want to work, but you have to work. Well, of course, I didn't work. And I showed up on a Monday. He didn't talk to me for two weeks. He was so mad at me. Uh, he wouldn't look at me even. He was so angry. But he, he never fired me because he knew that I would get a lot of work done and I never was late. I was late one time when I ran out of gas. I was 30 seconds late and I had to run home and get a gas can. But other than that, I was never late. <laughs> And, and he didn't want me, uh, he didn't want me to go away because I made money, I got jobs done. And then a beautiful thing happened about a month later, the same thing happened. And I got advance notice this time, about a week and a half before it happened. He said, you know, a week and a half from now, everybody's working Saturday. And he looked at me that time, right? So I knew what he meant. So after he said it, I, during a break, I went and talked to him and I said, look, um, you know I don't work Saturdays, but I got a request. Can I work nights, like leading up to this? I know what the project is and there's no reason I, that I can see I can't do this in advance. Like, let me go work four or five hours a night till dark on this outdoor project that we have. And I'll put my time in. In fact, I'll, I'll put double, triple time in if I have to, uh, to make up for that Saturday. He goes, okay. Ended up, I got the whole job done and nobody had to come in that Saturday. They all loved me after that. <laughs> I was like, man, we, way to go months. And if we get another Saturday thing, will you do that again? I'm, yeah, I do that. I'm, you know, I'm gonna keep my job and you guys are happy and I'm happy and, and it worked. 
but that's how you try to, that's, you got a better chance of keeping your job if you do things like that, then, you know, you show up late and you're kind of lazy when you get there and you don't really accomplish much. And then you go, man, I got fired for the Sabbath. I'm thinking, no, I don't think it was about the Sabbath. <laughs> I might've been about those other things. And now they have an excuse to say, bye-bye. Not always, okay? Sometimes people are really good employees and they do everything right and they still lose their job. And that's God testing them, right? He's saying, okay, now let's see what happens. Am I, do I come first or not? And they lose it. And usually, after it's all said and done, they get a good job, a better job, or more pay, and God works it out. Because their heart was right. They did the right thing. So sometimes you don't get off the hook. You know, sometimes God's real quick to intervene and answer your prayer and give you your request. Other times he just gives you the strength to get through it and you develop character and you don't get delivered and you work through it and you come out stronger on the other end. And he'll do that with the Sabbath. He'll do that with the holy days. But always make sure that you're doing your part so that it's not, you know, you getting uh, fired or let go for the wrong reasons. If it's for obeying God, God says, you just laid up treasure in heaven and I will reward you greatly for that in the future. I don't know how I got to there, but let's go back to Exodus 31. Oh, God does take it seriously there, verse 14. Verse 15, work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord, and whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. And one of the things we must do as parents is teach these things to our children and to our children's children and pass these laws and values and understanding uh, and these commandments on to our generations that, that uh, you know, are going to outlive us. Verse 17, it says, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So this is a sign between God and his people as well, the keeping of the Sabbath. This is part of how you identify the true church of God and God's true people, their Sabbath keepers. And I assure you, moving down the line, we will have to pull together as Sabbath keepers to, to get through some tough things. And we have to be ready for that. I mean, we're, we're saying this, but then when hard times come, a lot of times people cave and they, they fall out because they didn't really fully buy into it or really take it seriously. I'm telling you, take it seriously. There's a lot on the line here. Eternal life is on the line. This is a very important sign. And when we look at the pages of the Bible and we see what happened to people who didn't keep the Sabbath, it's tragic. When they knew better and they didn't do it. You know, God warned people, for instance, the people of Jerusalem, that if they did not keep the Sabbath holy, that he would destroy the city. Look at this example in Jeremiah 17, 27. Jeremiah 17, verse 27. And we'll see in this example, the people didn't listen. And God, God was pretty clear. Uh, God usually, well, always, I should say, sends servants to warn people about what's coming. And he tells them, repent or destruction lies at the door. And he's used prophets and, and others down through the pages of the Bible and through history to give these warning messages. And in this case, they were warned. And we go to, uh, uh, again, Jeremiah 17. Sorry, I'm in 27. Let's go back to Jeremiah 17, verse 27. Notice what it says here. It says, but if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when you're entering the gates of uh, Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall not be quenched. And again, they were doing business, right? Carrying the burden in, carrying, you know, buying and selling and, and carrying on uh, on the Sabbath like they did the other six days of the week. And uh, God says, knock it off, quit doing that. Or look, I'm gonna kindle a fire that's not gonna be quenched. And when we look at history, 
we see that God did destroy Jerusalem because they didn't heed the warning. Uh, we see that in uh, Jeremiah 52. Let's just look at that, the result here. Prophet Jeremiah records this. Jeremiah 52, verse 12. Really, this, this kind of goes all the way uh, from verse 12 through about verse 30. Uh, when you uh, take a look at what happened here, uh, you see that uh, truly uh, the city w w was burnt to the ground. And the sacking and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Chaldeans uh, was epic, and the captivity of its citizens, uh, these people went into captivity because of it, uh, was a result of breaking the Sabbaths uh, that God made holy, the weekly Sabbath and the annual Sabbaths. Now we see a number of years after this that God brought back some of the Jews and uh, he brought them back to Jerusalem and they rebuilt the city and they began to acknowledge and keep the Sabbath once again. Uh, several even then began to break the Sabbath day and Nehemiah, one of God's servants, warned them like, you know, knock it off guys or else we're gonna end up just like what, what happened in the past. Look at what, what Nehemiah said in, in Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah 13, 17 and 18. I'm just looking at a couple examples. We could turn to many uh, in the scriptures that show the result of not obeying God when it comes to the Sabbath commandment. And remember, the ancient Israelites were without God's spirit. These people uh, were a special people to God. Uh, God loved his people. Um, he gave them these commandments, but you know, we're without excuse when we have God's spirit, like what are we doing if we don't keep the Sabbath? These are carnal people and God said keep it and when they didn't do it, the consequences were heavy. We have God's spirit, we have more accountability. I mean, Christ came and he said, look, I'm not just gonna talk about the letter of the law anymore, I'm gonna make the law more honorable, like the Old Testament prophecy said, and I'm going to talk now more about the spirit of the law, the intent of the law, why we should do it, not just the letter of the law. And so Christ held us as members, uh, of uh, future members of his family and members of his church to a higher standard because we have God's spirit. Uh, so we're certainly without excuse. But in Nehemiah 13, verse 17, uh, Nehemiah says, Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do thus, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you are, yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So we see this many, many times. We see after Nehemiah, and I'm kind of going through history pretty quickly here, um, that it wasn't long. Uh, for people to get off track again, but Nehemiah was a good leader and he accomplished much and God used him in a powerful way. But after the death of Nehemiah, we see that the religionists in their zeal to keep the Sabbath holy began to legislate in minute detail what you could do on the Sabbath and what you could not do on the Sabbath. Now God, by contrast, when you look at Sabbath keeping in the Bible, gives us some basic spiritual principles. And he said, apply them, use some wisdom, use some discernment and apply these basic principles. And they can be applied to a number of situations in your life. But here it is a basic law of Sabbath keeping and I'll lay it out there for you. And he gives us some, some good details. But you see, the Pharisees said, look, that's not good enough for us. And the Pharisees said, these people are kind of stupid. Like they don't know enough, we know it all, right? And we're gonna to have to tell these people what they can and can't do. We're gonna to have to legislate this for them because the people, they're just not smart enough to get it. it sounds like what we live in today, right? <laughs> Same thing. But that's not true. God opens an individual's mind. They do get it. They can understand it. And, but here's what they did. Uh, they, they came up with just with regarding to prohibitive work on the Sabbath alone, they established 39 main categories of prohibited work on the Sabbath. And this was to establish a norm of Sabbath observance, that it would be universal, 
and that therefore they added to the laws of God. And all of us know that the Bible says don't add to or take away from God's laws. And they, they violated that clear principle and they added to the laws of God and they turned the Sabbath into a burden. And when Jesus Christ came along and he was teaching his disciples, they regularly accused Christ of breaking the Sabbath. Did Christ ever break the Sabbath? The answer is absolutely not. He was sinless. He was that lamb without spot, right? Without blemish. That was, you know, pictured by this Old Testament lamb, your best one. He never sinned. And yet they accused him regularly of breaking the Sabbath or his disciples of breaking the Sabbath because what they were really doing is breaking the laws that these men had come up with regarding how you should or not how you should not keep the Sabbath. And again, they made it a burden. It was no longer a blessing under those circumstances. And we just moved out of a place called Potomac, Maryland, 13 miles from downtown DC. And um, we live in a Jewish community and they're doing it just like they did in the days of Christ yet today. They have turned the Sabbath into a burden. If you get on an elevator on a Saturday, you don't ever press any buttons. You will stop at every floor because they have a Sabbath mode. They turn it on and the elevator, so you don't have to press a button because that's work. You just get on the elevator and you ride it and you stop at every floor. Joette works or was working with someone at work and uh, found out they're, they're Jewish and they drive their car near the synagogue on Friday before sundown and they stay in a home, like kind of a community home, and then they can walk less than a Sabbath day's journey to get to church and uh, to synagogue, they call it. And, and then they walk back to the house and when sun sets, they get in their car and go home. But she found out that uh, one of the coworker's sons who's Jewish is gonna be in a drama club and they're doing a Friday night production. And how do you do that? Like you're, I thought you were Jewish and you drove early and and all that, and well, he's not putting on his own makeup and he's not dressing himself, so it's fine. <laughs> what? Where's that in the Bible? Like, <laughs> see these added do's and don'ts, right? But then there's a, you know, a, a get away with murder card that you can play when you need to and do whatever you want anyway. It's hypocrisy. And they're playing games and it's not real. And that's what's happened in the day, that's what was happening in the days of Christ, and it's been happening ever since. So Christ said in Mark 2 27, once again, that the Sabbath was made for us, right? Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It was to help us, it was to enable us to live a happier and more abundant life, and it was not ever meant to be a burden for God's people. And I can say in my life, the Sabbath has never been a burden. Uh, we grew up in a household where we had to work a lot, but we never had to work after sundown on Friday night till sundown Saturday night. And we look forward to the break from the routine. And some of you work major hours and work hard all week long and you love the Sabbath because it's a break from the norm. And we'll talk more about exactly how big of a break, but again, it was, it was meant to be a blessing and our creator knew that we needed it. He goes, look, you're human, you're gonna need this. And so I'm gonna build this right in to this whole plan that I've got and uh, put this thing in motion from the very beginning. You know, we tend as human beings to become overly absorbed in our daily cares, you know, of life and Somewhat, it's understandable, right? You have to make money, you have to pay bills, you have to get things accomplished, and you get absorbed in that. And, and so when you get to this Sabbath day, when you gotta just stop all that for 24 hours, uh, that allows you to then maybe do a little more Bible study, get a little bit more rest, spend a little bit more time in fellowship. You're going to get at least a two hour service where you, you know, sing praises to God and have the fellowship with your brethren before and after and you learn about the scriptures and we read them and we explain the meaning and try to make that clear and you benefit from that and the more years you have in the more understanding you have because you've heard a lot of sermons you've been through a lot of your own personal Bible study and you begin to think like God and you begin to keep these laws as God intended and your life is better because of it and as 
Uh, we heard in the sermon that Mr. Loper here is famous of saying, look, I don't keep God's laws because I have to, I keep God's laws because I want to. And that's how we should all think. We do it because we want to, because we know God wants us to do it, and because we also know it's the best thing for us. All of the laws are that way. Thou shalt not murder. That's a really good law for you and me and our neighbors and everybody. And if people followed that law, we wouldn't have wars. We wouldn't have all these murders. I lived and pastored 10 years out in D.C. and Baltimore, and the murders are off the charts in Baltimore. It's a very dangerous, miserable place to go. And we have some brethren there. And, you know, I've got to go there, but I don't load up the wife and kids and go downtown Baltimore at night. It's not where you want to be. Unless you have to be, and then I'll go. Or, you know, hey, boys, let's go for a trip. <laughs> we got something to do here in Baltimore tonight. But the Sabbath is, it, again, and, and all the holy days, you know, think of the feasts and the benefits, uh, all these annual holy days and, and God's plan of salvation being outlined by them. What a blessing. What a what a privilege to be able to keep these things and, and to know about these things and put them into practice. Now, when God says rest, he's concerned really with two overall aspects of your life and my life on the Sabbath. First of all, God wants us, uh, he wants our time to be free of responsibilities and activities that we normally do on the other six days. He wants us our time to be free of that. Okay, we're free of work, we're free of those normal activities. You know, if you're an avid uh, sports enthusiast and you're watching football and all that, say, look, this is 24 hours, you don't do any of that. You like to fish and hunt? No, you don't get to go opening day. That's usually on a Saturday in many parts of the country, but you gotta sit that one out. And for some people that's a big test, but when it comes to hunting on opening day and eternal life, put it in the balance, like, okay, I'll have to give up this hunting on opening day. And what I've found anyway is most people in the church, their friends will hunt on opening day and they'll go out the day after and get the big buck. Anyway, like God goes, I got that covered too. Just, you kept my law and now I'll bless you. And I've been to your homes and you have them mounted on the wall and go, yeah, you didn't hunt on Sabbath and you still have that on your wall. God's got that covered like he does everything else. But God wants our time to be free from responsibilities and activities that we normally are involved in. And secondly, he wants our mind to be free from thinking about those daily responsibilities and activities. And that makes us free to properly worship God on the Sabbath. Now, certainly we can, like I said, physically rest more on the Sabbath, but the main emphasis in the Bible is not only that, but it's the day when we can serve God with our mind. We can think more about him, we can be more appreciative and some of the activities we did as kids growing up in the churches regularly on a Friday night, um, even before sunset, we'd go for a walk in a park or on a Saturday afternoon, if it was morning church or on a Saturday morning, if it was afternoon church, go for a walk down by the lake or out by a park uh, or sometimes have a picnic uh, out there or, or get together with other brethren. But you know, you're out there in the spring, the, the, everything's changing colors and the, the, the bees and the butterflies and everything are out when you're a kid it's awesome and and you're you're enjoying creation you're out there where you're kind of seeing what god made and stopping and taking time to smell the roses so to speak now when we look at god's instruction his positive instruction regarding the sabbath he gives us a little more detail in isaiah 58 let's go there isaiah 58 And you can see these are just general principles and guidelines. As Christians, we need to be balanced Christians. Uh, you know, I, I, all of you who've been around any time know that, look, there's some strange people in the Church of God, right? There always have been. And there's extremists, people out in this ditch and people out in that ditch, and God says, well, what are you doing? Come on, let's be more balanced, let's be normal. Let's, let's just do the things the way Christ would want us to do them and live like he did. Uh, we shouldn't be extremists and in a ditch, right? We should be, hey, what, is, what did Christ do? How did he do it? What does he tell us to do? Uh, you know, people might call us extremists if we keep the Sabbath or if we say that certain things are sinful. Uh, well, that's their problem. They're not, we're being balanced, we're being normal, we're listening to what God says. Uh, but when it comes to Sabbath keeping, notice what he says here. He gives us some really 
great guidelines beginning in verse 13 in Isaiah 58. He says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath the delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him not doing your own ways nor finding your own pleasure nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. What does he mean here when he says, he talks about your own ways, he talks about your pleasure, and he talks about your words. Your ways, this means your course of life, your employment, your enterprises, your finances, your business, right? The way you make a livelihood. You should not involve yourself in working at your normal things that you do during the week, week work week. The things that feed you, that clothe you and care for yourself physically. So that, that would also include working around the house and sewing and cleaning the whole house and washing the car. All the things that pertain to your physical maintenance during the normal course of the week. That's what he's talking about, your ways. Then he says your pleasure. He said, you know, when he says forsake that, the principle is that we should avoid having our mind and time and energy taken up with our hobbies, our sports, our pleasures, you know, fishing and hunting and all the other things that we normally do. And you know, your hobbies, you know, your woodworking and all that, it's, don't do that. God says knock that off for 24 hours as well. Take a break from that. And then finally, the toughest one of all, he says your words. So this is the spiritual application of the first two principles, right? And we know in Matthew 12, 34, God says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what we say, what the things that come out of our mouth, the things we talk about are what we're thinking about. And God says, I don't want you to think about your job and your bills and is your sports team winning or losing today or any of that for the 24 hours, just forget about that. If you're self-employed, that's not easy to do. But when you learn to do that, the Sabbath is way more of a blessing. And you have to learn, you don't take phone calls from sundown to sundown when it comes to work. You don't even think about it. That is holy time. That's not your time, that's holy time. God gave us this wonderful day and he said, don't do that. And when you can get to the point where you literally don't think about it, you don't worry about it, you start to enjoy the Sabbath in a way you can't imagine. Now, that doesn't mean you can never say anything about physical things ever on the Sabbath. I might say, hey, how's work going? It's physical, I ask you the question, you give me an answer. But if the entire Sabbath and our entire fellowship and conversation is caught up of <laughs> into what we're doing all week. That's where our mind is. We're not resting again. We're not really taking a break from that stuff. So we have to, we have to consider that. Like we have to think differently. You know, obviously that's a challenge, um, but once you get to that point where you just, it, it, you have peace of mind like you never had before. Because it's very easy for us as humans to worry about it the bill or worry about, oh, I'm not going to have that job done in time or the builder's not going to be happy or the whatever, you know, my boss. And kids, if you have school work, don't do it on Sabbath. You get a break from that too. And, and God wants you to take a break from that. You know, sometimes I'm at the feast, I see these kids doing homework on a holy day. I go, what are you doing? You're supposed to take a break too. You don't have to do that. Mom and dad, what are you doing? Let them take a break from that. You shouldn't be having to do that on a Sabbath or a holy day. They, they get a break too. I love growing up in a home, house where, where dad gave us, at least gave us a break on those things, right? Like we weren't even allowed to. He put the book away. <laughs> Thanks, dad. <laughs> now I get a break, right? That's what God wants us to, to do. He really wants us to benefit us in a great way. And if we do what he says, all of a sudden we're beginning to see the benefits and realize the benefits. Um, God also wants us to prepare for the Sabbath. People sometimes forget that. When you look in the Old Testament and they were out gathering manna, God says, look, you gotta gather up some extra man a manna on Friday because I don't want you doing it on the Sabbath. And I don't want you to go out and gather firewood. Some people 
don't understand that either because I've been camping and I've walked over and put, picked up a log and put it on the fire on the Sabbath. And I continue to do that. You know, sir, you're gathering firewood. Okay, put three million people in this campsite for a few days and see how much firewood's left. There won't be any four miles. Now go gather firewood. I gotta walk a long ways. It's gonna be a big effort to get it. And that's why God said, don't do it. Not because it was laying right there and I put it on the fire so it could stoke the fire and enjoy it a little bit more. Right, balance, think for a second. What was, what was the intent of God's command when he said, don't gather firewood on the Sabbath? It was because of that. Right, don't go chop down the tree and split the logs or go far away to gather it and carry it all the way back and you're gone for hours. That's what would have happened. And so God said, don't do it. Gather it Friday, prepare for the Sabbath. That way you can enjoy it more. So the heavy cooking, right? We try to do in advance. I use an example, potato salad, right? Like I've made potato salad, but it takes a lot of work. I gotta boil and peel the eggs. I gotta boil the potatoes. I gotta dice them, I gotta cool them. It's like, I can do that Friday. I can shove that in the fridge and pull it out Saturday. It's even better the next day. And it's been in the fridge and I didn't have to do all that work on the Sabbath. That's a way I can prepare, right? That's the intent of what God asks us to do by preparing for the Sabbath. It makes really good sense when you think of it. You don't have to do this huge production of uh, elaborate foods. Do that ahead of time, the elaborate salads and dressings and things that require hours to cook. I'm not gonna go out and stand behind my smoker for hours on the Sabbath. I can do that six days of the week, but you know that takes a lot of time and I gotta monitor it and get it just right. Uh, you know, If I wanna smoke it Friday and warm it up Saturday, fine. Uh, balance, can you throw an egg in a skillet or make a pancake on a Sabbath? Of course. Makes Sabbath awesome. It's not a lot of time, it's not a lot of work. Balance, moderation. We should have, again, sumptuous meals on the Sabbath. The Sabbath should be something that our, our kids look forward to. The annual Sabbath, a holy day, something our kids look forward to, that they enjoy, that they have positive memories of, not, man, it's a burden, it's miserable, I hate the church. And I always tell our speakers, by the way, prepare, and, and obviously uh, our sermonette man uh, did today, Mr. Scott. Don't waste everybody's time, right? Put some effort into it. Because kids, I've grown up in, in congregations, I've been part of congregations where I was bored out of my mind for years. I'm like, man, this is a grind, <laughs> especially in the 90s. <laughs> Going to church, man, I just, I'm doing it because God, you told me I have to be here, but this is horrible. This is boring, I'm not learning anything. In fact, I'm learning wrong stuff. I gotta, I gotta put that out of my mind. <laughs> So it can be a challenge. So, you know, we have a responsibility as speakers to, to put the time in. God's got to inspire it, but put the time in. I didn't put as much time in this, but I got a lot of years in this. And so I guess I did put the time in. I've done a lot of sermons on the Sabbath, so this didn't take a lot of time. But put the time in and think about it, you know, and don't waste people's time. Make the Sabbath special. Now, we, we see, let, let's look at a couple more things here regarding the Sabbath. Did Christ keep the Sabbath? Look at Luke 4. You already know the answer, but if somebody asks you, you can point it out. I'll just look at one verse here, Luke 4, uh, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So it was his custom, it's what Christ did. Uh, verse 31 says he went, uh, then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. So yes, Christ regularly attended church services in the synagogue on the Sabbath, that was his custom, that's what he did. He did. And you can find him there. I've often told congregations I pastor, can I find you at church on the Sabbath? Because our attendance is not always so good. Are you one of the people in the congregation that I can, if, if I was betting on you, that you be there or not be there, I could say this person will be there. I assure you, if they're not sick, they're gonna be at church. I can tell you that because that's what they do. They're always there. I have other people flip a coin. I have no clue if they're going to be here or not because their attendance is pathetic. They don't really take it seriously enough. 
It isn't a big deal to them. It would have been in the Old Testament, right? Death penalty, pretty important. But we live in a world today where we don't put enough emphasis on what God tells us to do. And, and then we don't do it in the way he tells us to do it. And then we lack the faith to do it when it gets a little challenging. So this was his custom. You wonder what Christ is on the Sabbath. I know where you can find him. He's going to be in the synagogue, 100%. You don't have to worry whether he's going to attend or not. He's going to be there. That's what his custom was. What about uh, the others in the New Testament? Even after the death of Christ, we see that it was Paul's custom in Acts 17, verses 1 and 2. It says, now when they had passed through, I'm not even going to pronounce that today because the light's not so good, and I'm not sure what that is. But anyway, read verse 1, get to verse 2, and it says, Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. So where was Paul? He was in synagogue, reasoning, teaching on the Sabbath. We see in Acts 13, 13, there's a couple more here, New Testament Scriptures and New Testament Church keeping the Sabbath. Acts 13, 13. It says, now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So once again, we've seen them going into the synagogue on the Sabbath. Uh, verse 42, verse 44, also say that that was the case for the New Testament church. They were Sabbath keepers. There's really no question about it, if you're honest, that the true church of God observed the seventh day Sabbath. And those who are striving to obey God today will also be keeping the same day, the seventh day of the week, holy according to scripture and following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. So you know where I'm going already. I'll start at verse 19, uh, the subheading in my Bible. And again, those aren't inspired. It says, hold fast your confession. Acts 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter in the, holy, uh, the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest, over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So as you see the day of Christ's return approaching, it's all the more important that we assemble on the Sabbath and not forsake that assembly. That's very important to God. Could God have looked forward in time when he inspired this to be written to the days that we live in now? How many prophecies in the Bible where he looked forward in time have been fulfilled when we talk about Christ and, and what he did the number of prophecies is very big that were fulfilled exactly as they've been prophesied in the Old Testament God's able to look for and prophecy make prophecy and, and make sure that those prophecies happen he saw a time near the end where people would forsake the assembly and he said don't let that happen to you this is worth fighting for even Protestant churches in the world today understand this is worth fighting for. Not all of them, some of them. And more of them need to get in that fight. And we need to be in that fight. Nothing should stop us from assembling on the Sabbath ever. If you're sick, don't show up. That's what the Bible says. Look, you got COVID or you got a cold or you got measles or you got whatever. Quarantine yourself. If you're sick, you shouldn't be here. That's what God said. He never said the whole population should quarantine itself, ever. That's from man. They're all screwed up. They don't know what they're doing. They screw everything up. God says, look, go to work. You're healthy. If you're not healthy, then 
you shouldn't be there. You shouldn't be at church. You shouldn't be at work. Stay home. Don't spread that disease. That's what God said. Man has a whole other plan. They're just blind, stumbling around, making stupid decisions, doing the wrong thing. We don't have to be blind. We know what the Bible says. I'm a minister. You know, I'm, if somebody gets sick, what does God tell me? Social distance? No, he says, lay hands on them, touch them. Christ laid his hands on a man that was full of leprosy. That's pretty contagious stuff. I've never heard of a minister in the Church of God getting sick, anointing someone for sickness. If that happened, tell me. I don't know of an example. I've anointed people who had COVID, and they were really coughing and really sick when I did it. Was I afraid to do it? No, because God's got it. He told me to lay hands on them. I go and lay hands on them. I anoint them. God will take care of them. They'll be healed. We're good. He said so. I, if God said it, that's all I need to hear. That's good enough for me. That's my job. That's what I should be doing. I'm going to go do it. I'm not going to social distance. I'm going to mail in an anointing cloth. There's, if I'm afraid, then God goes, you don't have enough of my Holy Spirit because I didn't give you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Go do your job, man. And trust me, I'm God. You know who I am. I got that. Go do it. We need to think more like that. That's another thing Christ said at the time of the end. Will I find faith on the earth? He didn't say that for no reason. He realized there'd be so little faith. Well, I even find it. I hope we can find it among you and I and other people in the church of God. We are just trying to do what we always did. Assemble on the Sabbath. What else are we trying to sing on the Sabbath? Go, let's look at something here that, that I want to point out regarding singing and uh, Sabbath observance. <clears throat> And by the way, I don't know if I said this, the word Sabbath is taken from the Hebrew. It literally means a repose, an intermission, a cessation, or rest. I mean, it's an appropriate word, right, for, for what we're doing. But I want to go to Psalm 95. Let's just take a look at the first couple of verses here in Psalm 95. It says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. There are people who say, We're not commanded to sing on the Sabbath. I beg to differ. That's not what those verses say. They're pretty clear. In fact, it's the part of the service that we all participate in, right? Not everybody gets to give a sermon, the sermonette, or lead the songs, but we all sing praises to God on the Sabbath. We just want to sing praises to God on the Sabbath because he tells us to do it, and there are people who tell me, you can't do that, I'm not going to let you do that. What? No, I'm going to be doing that. Nothing's going to stop me ever from doing that. I'll even sing if I'm in prison because I see that's what they did in the book of Acts. Let's keep singing. God tells us to. Is he going to let me die because I sing praises to him in his house where he commands me to be? Are you kidding me? Let's think about that for a minute. Psalm 100. Verse 1. Make a joyful shout to the Lord with all, uh, all you land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. We literally come before God's presence on the Sabbath. We've said it forever in the church of God. Look, when you come to church, how you dress is important because you're coming into God's presence. Put your coat and tie on, put your dress on, dress up, wear your good clothes, in just showing respect and honor for God. We sometimes have new people. They don't get it. They don't come dressed properly. I don't say, you leave, because you're not dressed properly. They're brand new, they don't know. We'll work with them, we'll get that right. At least they're here, now we can, what's next? We'll start fixing those things as quickly as possible. But we all know better. We say, look, let's dress up, come to church. We're going before God. We're coming literally into his presence. We still are, by the way. When you come in here, you're, we are in the presence of God. 
in his house where he tells us to be. I'm going to tell you he's got it. People ask me, why won't you wear a mask at church? But I've seen you at Home Depot with it because I'm not coming into the presence of God there. This is a holy convocation that God commands me to be at. When I come here, I'm not wearing a mask, ever. God's got it. He's my maker. He's in the hall. He's standing here. Why would I wear a mask ever in his presence? I'm not going to do it. I got fired for that and because I was going to sing and it's on Sabbath, I'll live with that. But that can't change. Either God's going to protect us or he's not. Yes, we do our part, but our part is don't come here sick right now in the current situation. God's very clear about singing when we come into his presence. When do we do that? Here on the Sabbath. We do it when we pray and, and there are some who sing in their prayers. Not me so much, because I don't do special music and stuff, but I know people who do it. It's certainly fine, and God appreciates it. I make a joyful noise. We should teach our children to, to sing and to sing out at Sabbath services. This is how you show respect and honor for God, and you give thanks to him. You know, when we talk about dress, we see in the Bible that, that Christ, uh, in one of his parables, uh, expelled a man from the wedding celebration because they weren't dressed properly. Again, it came to the wedding. It wasn't showing honor and respect for, for everybody that was present. And he said, look, man, why aren't you dressed right? Get out. Now, we know the spiritual application of that is what's really at the heart of what, what he was trying to get across in that parable. But I think the other applies as well. And, uh, you know, we've been living 13 miles from the White House for the last almost 10 years. The end of this month will be exactly 10 years. And I can tell you, you don't ever go in to see the president with your flip-flops and jeans and your muscle shirt on, right? You don't do that. He's the president, whoever it is, and you have to dress appropriately, and there are rules you have to follow. And they're a human, right? That's not God. It's, it's a matter of respect. And so when it comes to church services, that, that's why we dress the way we do, and we conduct ourselves the way we do, and it's... And we've read some verses on why we sing. And we can look at many, 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 many more verses about that. You know, another thing comes up, and it has to do with uh, the ox in the ditch or uh, situations where we handle emergencies. And the Bible talks about that as well in, in Luke's account. Uh, let's go back there to Luke. And see what God says about the uh, the ox in the ditch and dealing with that uh, on the Sabbath. Uh, and I will say that in the years I've been in the church, that there are people uh, that uh, push the ox in the ditch sometimes, right? And uh, God doesn't want us to do that either. Uh, God wants us, you know, to certainly do our part. Uh, but there are certain things uh, that happen in our lives, but that are. are legitimate emergencies and God gives us guidance on how to deal with those as well uh, let's take a look at um, Luke 14 verse 5 that that section actually I'm going to back up to verse 3 sorry about that it says, and Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, "Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath?" But they kept silent. And he took, and he took him and healed him, and let him go. Then he answered them, saying, "Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day?" And they could not answer him regarding these things. So the point was, he Christ just healed somebody, and they accuse him of breaking the Sabbath. Right? They're they're scrutinizing him on this. And they did this on other occasions as well in his ministry. But he said, look, if you've got an ox or you've got a, a, a donkey that falls in a pit, you're going to get that donkey or that ox out. Now, anybody who's farmed and dealt with animals realizes that animal will struggle and exhaust itself and actually die if you don't pull it out of the pit. Well, it, won't get, it won't quit trying, and, and it, will, it will struggle to death. So he says, go get the ox out. The life of the ox is more important now, 
I can imagine without a tractor getting an ox out of the ditch, man, get your buddies, all your strongest people over there because it's a lot of work to get a rope on that heavy animal and drag them out of the pit, but you save the animal's life. Now that's a genuine emergency. The principle of the ox in the ditch applies to genuine emergencies. Might be a personal injury. You're in a car wreck. Wow, well, I gotta wait till sundown before I go to the hospital. What? No, go now. You know, let's save you. Or let's get that you know, bone set. A hurricane or a tornado or a big earthquake. You know, which would entail injury or loss of life or loss of personal property. Your water, you know, one of your water lines breaks in your house and you go, man, I don't dare turn it off till the sun sets. I know it's gonna flood the whole house, but uh, you know, of course, go shut the water main off. You know, use your brain for emergencies. I pulled over on the Sabbath and pulled people out of the ditch. I always throw a toe strap in the back so I can pull people out if I, if I have time. Now, it's 100 cars in the ditch. I guess you guys are going to be a while. The records are coming. I got to get to church. I don't have time. But here's one, and I can help, and I have time to do it. I can pull them out of the ditch, you know, or give them a ride. I, I can stop and do that. Uh, again, uh, there are things that happen uh, that we have to make allowances for, and God understands that. He isn't so rigid that you can't just use your brain and, and apply this principle. When I say don't push the ox into the ditch, uh, don't take a job where you know you're required to work on the Sabbath. You just push, you're not required, and you don't have to, and you shouldn't. If you're a doctor or you're a nurse and a tornado rips through your town, you're probably gonna be tending to people in their lives all day on the Sabbath. That was an emergency. And you need to save lives and do everything you can in a case like that. Of course, we understand it, but use your head when it comes to this. And if you don't know, ask. We'll try to give you some guidance or some general principles that will help give you the answer to your question uh, regarding whether or not it's really an emergency or not. But the basic uh, principles that we see with regarding, uh, regarding keeping the Sabbath, we also have one regarding farming. Let's look at that. Uh, take a look at, uh, this is an important one uh, in, um, well, I already mentioned Luke, uh, where we, we see that it's permissible to water your livestock on the Sabbath. Luke 13, 15 was the reference. Maybe I gave that, maybe I didn't. But take a look at that. We see in, in the Old Testament, uh, in the book of Exodus that God says in plowing time, like in seeding time and in harvest, right? In the spring when you're planting your crops and in the fall when you're harvesting your crops, you still have to keep the Sabbath. You have to take a break from that regular routine. Regardless of weather, regardless of machinery breakdown, God says, nope, want you to take a break from that uh, in, in those times of year when it's the busiest for a farmer. Keeping the Sabbath trumps it. It's more important to God. So we can see when we look at how Christ dealt with the Sabbath himself in the gospel accounts and the life and teachings of Jesus, we can see in the guidelines that he gave ancient Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, how we, these basic principles, how we should keep the Sabbath and what we should or should not do in the Sabbath. And, and people say, look, there's a lot of gray areas. I think they become white or black, if you're honest. And if it's a matter of you're not sure, then don't do it. Whatever's not a faith is sin, right? If I'm not sure I should be doing this on the Sabbath, then don't do it. Get some more counsel, get some advice. When you keep the Sabbath, not only do you get blessed, but you make God happy. Why did the, why did the tribes of Israel, why, why were there 10 tribes that become the lost 10 tribes? One of the main reasons is they forgot about the Sabbath, the annual Sabbath and the, the weekly Sabbath. And they lost their identity. How come the Jews still know who they are today? Because they've never stopped keeping the Sabbath. Now they do it terribly. They do it in form, not, not in real substance, but they never lost sight of when the Sabbath is and they get that. It's interesting, God entrusted the keeping of the calendar to them, right? The oracles were committed to the Jews and they've done that well, they, but then they get Passover on the wrong night. They got the calendar right, but they got Passover on the wrong night. They don't do it perfectly themselves, but they at least took care of that job that God gave them. 
they've also, the, the, the Old Testament scriptures were entrusted to their care. And if you go to DC and you go through the Bible Museum, you can see how painstakingly careful they were with every letter and, and these scribes were very careful to try and do it right. Now in translations into other languages, sometimes they added verses or they did things that they shouldn't. And we've, you know, clearly when we come to those, we know that these don't belong in the Bible or that word's italicized, the translators added it, they perverted the meaning by do it, doing it into English. And I look forward to the day we have one pure language that's gonna resolve a lot of issues. But the, the bottom line is that God gave them that job and they, they were responsible to preserve those things. And we have them today because they did their jobs. And, and a lot of those people lost their lives doing what they did. When this Bible got translated into languages, a lot of people died that, that were responsible for make, making that happen. And we have Bibles, all of us have Bibles. Most of us have multiple copies of the Bible. This is very, very rare in human history. The scribes had them, right? They went in and read from the scrolls in the synagogue, but not everybody went home and read their Bible. They didn't have one. We do, and we don't value it enough sometimes. We don't even take time to read it. Know what's in it, practice it. This is a true blessing. And as Mr. Armstrong used to say, look, we're gonna be educating people in the world tomorrow. Who better to educate people the people who had all these Bibles and all this time to learn it, study it, know it, teach it, so that they can pass it on. God's got an important job for you, but if you're going to teach this, you got to know it. You got to start studying it, learning it, putting it into practice so that you then can teach others. And, and not just by words, but by your actions, like Jesus Christ did. He kept the Sabbath. He got baptized, not because he had any sins that needed to be removed, right? set an example for us. He washed the disciples' feet, not because he had, you know, he wasn't humble enough, because he needed to learn the lesson of, look, if you're a leader, you need to be a humble, uh, you know, a servant leader. It's very important that you guys learn that. So you guys, all your disciples get in here and wash one another's feet, just like I wash your feet. And I'm your master and I'm doing it. I'm teaching you a lesson here that I want you to really get. It's super important. Catch the lesson. So Christ did these things not because he had to, because he wanted to lead by example. We live in a world where people don't lead by example, right? We have politicians who say one thing and they do the exact opposite all the time. They tell us to do something and they don't do it. They're hypocrites. They, they, they say and they don't do, just like Pharisees, scribes, and other religious leaders in the days of Christ, they say and didn't do it. We have to be different. We have to practice what we preach and do what we tell others to do. So it's a very important uh, command in the Bible, um, and it's something that we need to once in a while go over, review, make sure that we understand it, make sure that uh, we're keeping it properly. If there's areas we can improve on, the sins in our life, and we're not really doing it right, fix it, like we heard in the sermonette today. There's some things you know you can do better. It's time to adjust. It's time to make those adjustments. Clean up your act, right? Prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. This Sabbath is going to be kept in the millennium, right? We're going to be teaching it. We're going to be leading by example. It's going to be kept in the great white throne judgment. As long as there's a plan of God, we're moving forward. This, this is important, just like the holy days. So the Sabbath is very important. And God does give us plenty of instruction and guidelines on what to do and what not to do and these basic principles outlined in Scripture. So let's put it to use. For more information, go to our website at cogassembly.org. Copyright 2020, Church of God Assembly, all rights reserved.